I'm Dave Stouffer. This is reading number four, episode number four, of J.C.'s World, from the novel The Reverend Mr. J.C., When Appearances Are Not Enough, written by me, yours truly. Are you enjoying the book so far? If you are, please make a comment down below so that the folks at the Washington Library can know if you're enjoying this kind of content on their YouTube page. Things have started to look up for the Reverend Mr. J.C. Wesley, or John, as he's now getting used to, uh, as he gets used to Pastor James' new name for him. As you heard last time, he's had some successes. He's learned that as a pastor, his job includes helping his flock's spiritual and physical needs, helping them to understand the Bible, and fixing the roofs and their plumbing. Then at Christmas, he learns another lesson. Darkness is a great equalizer. Objects that are glaringly ugly in the daylight soften and become more pleasing to the eye in the dark. So it was with the old building of Prophetstown Trinity Church that Christmas Eve. No peeling paint, no scuffed and dirty exterior walls. Even the cracks in the steps seemed to smooth and disappear. Most distinctive were the windows. They were not the best stained glass, and daylight would reveal their cracks and patches, but on this Christmas Eve, they glowed with a soft golden light. People walked quietly to the church doors, and the reason for that beautiful glow in the windows became apparent as rack after rack of candles were the only light in the sanctuary. Word of the service had spread throughout the community, and Trinity Church members who had washed and polished and vacuumed and tidied to a fairly well could look round their sanctuary and see friends and some strangers from most of the other churches in town. Trinity Church members sat quietly as rest, but proudly. The dancing candle flames created an old world effect made even more real by the eight a cappella voices that blended together. Most folks didn't understand the words, and maybe most of the octet didn't either. The common language was the beautiful, pure notes rising and carrying around the sanctuary. There were no announcements, there were no introductions. When the octet finished, then Charles Waterman read the first scripture. Charles, J.C., and the octet were all dressed in Trinity Church choir robes, which in the overhead lighting looked somewhat shabby, but which in the candlelight looked wonderfully fine. And so it went, singing, reading, singing, reading, the voice being shared by the octet, then one of the men, then the other, seamlessly back and forth. Just when you didn't think you could take any more of the sight and sound and beauty of it all, Paul Anderson's nephew, dressed also in a choir robe, stood in the shadows of the altar and played O Holy Night. No showboating by anyone. Just voices and music coming together in a way that thrilled and mystified the people. Something wonderful had happened. Something awesome they had been a part of, and that was the truth of it. Only those who read or sang or prayed were actively involved, but every person there, including the little children who sat so very quiet without their parents urging, everyone felt they had participated. At the end, when the last note had faded away into the candlelight, there was no applause. The participants merely turned and went into the room off the pulpit area. There was no buzz of conversation as at the end of a regular service. There was no reaching across the aisle to shake hands. There was a glow in the hearts and souls of the people there that was not all made by the candles burning. They knew that they had just experienced something so magnificent that perhaps it could never be repeated. More than one handkerchief came out of purse or pocket to dry eyes. More than one arm was quietly put around the shoulders of another adult or child. More than one pair of hands was joined. The service continued despite the participants having left the platform. The service continued because it was worship.
The Reverend James Edwards sat near the front and prayed. He thanked God for bringing these people together on this night, and he thanked God for allowing him to be a part of the time in Prophetstown that people from all different churches came together to worship as one, without creeds or doctrines, rules or regulations, to open their hearts to feel God's blessing. After a long while, it seemed, he heard rustlings around him as people slowly left the church. James sat there for quite a while, and then, finding a candle extinguisher in the back of the church, he put out the candles up and down the sides of the church. He didn't know why, but something urged him to let the candles on the altar keep burning. He hadn't seen any of the service participants leave the room behind the pulpit, and he assumed when J.C. left, he'd see the candles and put them out. Reverend James Edwards walked to the parsonage, poured himself a cup of coffee. He was hoping that J.C. would come soon so they could share together this awesome thing that God had created. He waited, pondered, prayed, poured more coffee. It was now past 9.30. If John was on another of his walks, well, he needed to blow out the candles and close up the church. The sanctuary was exactly how he had left it, with the candles on the altar providing the only illumination. Even in the dim light, James could make out the figure of J.C. sitting on the front pew. He was sitting with his elbows on his knees and his head in his hands. As James drew closer, he heard the words, It's wrong. It's wrong. It's so wrong. Like a chant or a litany, J.C. was repeating those words, unaware that he wasn't alone anymore. Softly, James walked up to the center aisle carpet and slipped into the pew behind J.C. Only then did J.C. realize he wasn't alone, and he straightened up. He turned a tear-streaked, agonized face toward James. It's wrong, James. It's wrong. Help me here. John, what's wrong? The service? No. No. That was right. So right. So what is wrong, John? A flash of the regular J.C. appeared as he said, Don't you know, James? I thought you knew everything. Oh, God, I'm so confused. Now you're on the right track, John. I don't know everything, but God does. Tell him what's wrong. I can't. I, I cannot do that. But John, he already knows. Whatever it is, he already knows. And whatever it is, he loves you more than that. Whatever it is, he loves you more. J.C. rubbed a fist across his eyes, sniffed rather loudly. God doesn't talk to me like he does you, James. I can sit here and I can talk to him out loud all night long, and he won't say anything to me. I do know this, John. Very rarely does God ever use real words in a human tongue when he communicates with us. You must learn to listen to your heart. You must learn to trust that which comes into your head could in fact be the voice of God. James, I've been going to Hampton's Park and sitting on that bench in Mrs. Hampton's Arbor about once a week. The first time I was there, I felt a peace, a peace I didn't understand, a peace that had never been in me. And James, that was after I had been mad and swore at God. Do I have to get mad at God to feel that peace which, which now you're telling me may be his voice? No. No, John, you don't have to get mad at God. What's the most horrible thing that I've ever said to you, John? Well, James, now that you ask, I'm so tired of hearing my way or the highway that I can hardly take it. Do you think you've learned anything here in Prophetstown doing it my way? Yeah, I learned how to paint, hammer, build some things, 
digging the dirt and read scriptures to little old ladies. Did you know how to do those things before? No. Would you be surprised, John, if I told you that my motto is kind of God's motto too? You mean God says my way or the highway? What do you do best, John? Putting your ego aside, what do you do best? Well, I've been preaching since I was nine years old. I've studied it. I've studied drama. I've studied theater. So you're a good public speaker. Yes, I am. What would you say, John, if I suggested to you that that is a gift, a gift given to you by God, a gift to be used to his glory, to his purposes, and not to your own ego and gain? What would you say? J.C. Jerkback paused in the act of lifting his hand to his face as if he'd been hit, and the tears reappeared in his eyes. Then his shoulders shook, and while James reached from the pew behind him to grasp his shoulders, John Charles Wesley, the Reverend Mr. J.C., cried as if his heart was broken. It seemed the glow of the remaining candles intensified. It seemed to James like there was someone, something else in the room, and he sat quietly, praying. James? James? I... I, I don't know my Bible like you do. I have a verse going around in my head. Can you help me find it? James picked up a pew Bible and said, Do you know the book? I, I think it's in the Psalms. It has to do with worship, and it has to do with God's voice. That's it. It's about God's voice. James flipped the pages. Does Psalm 29 ring a bell, John? James squinted a bit in the candlelight and began to read, the voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The glory of God thundereth. I think, I think that's it, James. It's about the voice of God. James continued to read. The Lord is upon many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaketh the cedars. The voice of the Lord divideth the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shaketh the wilderness. The voice of the Lord maketh the hinds to calve, and discovereth the forests, and in his temple doth every one speak of his glory. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. James finished reading. I know, James, the power of a voice. I know what a singing or speaking voice can bring about in people. Tonight I heard the voices, the voices of the kids, Charles Waterman's voice, my voice, the voice of the trumpet, and it was real. All the voices were just one voice. It was God's voice, wasn't it, James? It was for me, John. And judging from the way people stayed and then quietly went away, I think it was for them too. It wasn't Charles Waterman's voice, nor yours, nor the trumpet players, nor the octet. Your voices were given over in unity to the worship of God, just like it says in the psalm. And as you gave glory to God, I feel he gave power through his voice to the people. I know, James. I'm not stupid. I know there was a difference tonight. When we got into the back room after the service, there was Paul's nephew from another town, Doreen, who just occasionally attends here, the octet from several different churches, brought together at school, and it was just like we were family. Nobody said, good job. Nobody, not even me, asked how they do. Did I do okay? It was different, James. It was like that first day in Mrs. Hampton's Arbor. I think I'm tired now, James. I think I'm tired. 
Well then, let's go home, John. With this insight that his abilities are a gift from God, J.C. has reached a turning point in his spiritual life. But like many of life's changes, it's a long, slow curve to a new level. Being separated from his wife and daughter has enabled J.C. to focus on needed changes, but it will require more changes if they can resume life together. We pick up J.C.'s story the very next day, Christmas Day, 19. 94. Ruth Gillette Wesley sat in the next to the last pew of Prophetstown Trinity Church. Her daughter sat next to her, and her father and mother, Ed and Mary Ann, sat on the other side of Jill. Ruth wondered, for it seemed like the millionth time, what she was doing there. When J.C. had asked that she and Jill come to church in Prophetstown on Christmas morning, she had agreed for Jill's sake. After all, they were still a family, though there was a mile of separation between Ruth and J.C. Truth be told, Ruth had been happy, happier than she thought she would be, living in the guest room of her parents' house. She enjoyed giving piano lessons, and she enjoyed helping around the house. And Jill, with the cultish, carefree way of a 14-year-old, had accepted her father's absence, even though she didn't particularly understand it. So Ruth had said yes, they would come, but she asked her parents to come too. She was just a little apprehensive. It would be the first time they had been in church with J.C. since that Sunday, that embarrassing, horrible Sunday, and knowing J.C., he would have some sort of theatrical trick to pull. Even though it was one of the major celebration days of the Christian year, she just didn't trust him. She needed moral support, she told them, so there they sat. She looked in the bulletin for this Christmas Sunday morning and saw the plan of a master service builder. She had to admit, J.C. had always been good at putting together special service days. The choir had two numbers, the Williams family were going to light the Advent candles. She saw names beside poetry titles that she knew from experience would belong to the youth group members. And then opposite the heading sermon, his name, the Reverend John Charles Wesley, had no title. J.C. liked to do that, no title. He wanted his sermon to erupt like a jack-in-the-box, fully formed, fully sprung, and full of himself. They had been married 15 years, and J.C. had been the pastor at three churches during that time. And Ruth could pretty much tell you on any given Sunday what the sermon would be. Today's Christmas morning sermon was a work of art. It contained the best of the tools in J.C.'s theatrical arsenal. To give him credit, it wasn't the same words in the same way repeated by rote every year. There had been continual tweaks and polishing. In a way, Ruth was ready to hear that sermon again. It had become like the Advent candles, Christmas tree lights, and plum pudding, one of the traditions of Christmas. She knew that was wrong, but she also knew that if he stayed with what he knew, life would be safe at least for the next hour or so. She was surprised to see his name by the sermon in the bulletin. He let it slip in one of their weekly phone calls that Reverend Edwards was not letting him preach. She didn't know what that was all about. When she asked her dad, Ed said, it's James Edwards' way, and J.C. will, I hope, benefit from it. The choir filed in, followed closely by four nervous high schoolers, two boys and two girls, who sat in folding chairs in front of the choir. They were followed by an older man that Ruth guessed was James Edwards, and by J.C. Ruth craned her neck to make sure she could see J.C.'s trademark Florsheim Imperials shine to a high gloss on this high church morning. Reverend Edwards stood and opened the worship service the way he always did. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Reverend Edwards could use a haircut, she thought. Of course, J.C. was barbered to the nines. She continued to contrast the men. Reverend Edwards looked like a working man, J.C. a salesman. Reverend Edwards handled his Bible as though it was a beloved possession. 
J.C. held his so that it would be obvious to those watching that it was an expensive book in his collection. She recognized it, the one he never opened except on Sunday mornings to read the scripture and then take his sermon notes from. She had always noticed his shoes. She swung her gaze to Reverend Edward's feet, plain-toed Oxfords, black. They'd come with a good shine when new, but probably hadn't been fussed with much since. What a contrast, Ruth thought. It was like night and day. What do they talk about? How can they possibly have anything to share? The youth group, one at a time, stumblingly read their poems, grinned self-consciously at their families in the pews, and sat down. The choirs swelled like banty roosters, puffed out their chest, and delivered themselves of the pieces they'd worked on so hard for Christmas. And with a great flutter of robes, sat down. There was a rustle as people looked at their bulletins to see what came next. And when they had read, all eyes swiveled to the audience's right where the pulpit stood and where behind it on an upholstered chair sat the Reverend Mr. J.C. He stood. Carrying his beautiful leather Bible with the gold edges, he took the three steps that brought him to the pulpit. Ruth thought, he looks uncomfortable. He's not talking yet. There's something wrong. J.C. stood there for what seemed like an hour, but was in fact just a minute or so. When he spoke, his voice was not the trained voice the people of the church had grown to enjoy when he read scriptures and poetry during their weekly services. Instead of his head erect and his piercing eyes meeting those of the congregants, his chin almost rested on his chest. And when he did in fact speak, you had to listen very hard to hear what he had to say. Ruth exchanged puzzled glances with her father and mother, then turned back to hear J.C. say, in a voice a little like the old J.C., Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. This morning, I would like to give each of you a gift. He shot a glance over his right shoulder to where James was sitting. There were questions in James' eyes, and J.C. softly said in his direction, I'm sorry. Where was I? I'd like to give you a gift. First, I'd, I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Ruth, and our daughter, Jill. Would you please make them feel welcome? He gestured in their direction, and all heads turned, smiles beaming toward that pew. For various uh, personal reasons, Ruth and Jill are not often here, but I'm happy that we can be together today as a family. Perhaps you notice the other two people sitting with them. They are her parents, Marianne Gillette and Dr. Edwin Gillette. Now here's the gift. Dr. Gillette is a district superintendent in Trinity Churches and lives in Van Buren. His duties are mostly administrative and supervisory, so he doesn't get a chance to fill the pulpit very often. Jay seemed, seemed to be having trouble with his voice. I took the liberty without even consulting you, Pastor James, to ask Dr. Gillette if he would bring this morning's message. J.C.'s voice was stumbling, his hands were twitching over the pulpit. He looked quite uncomfortable. And, and he said he would be honored. There was a stir of excitement. With obviously nothing else to say, J.C. extended his hand toward Dr. Gillette and said, Sir? He waited until Ed came down the aisle, stepped up the platform stairs, and they shook hands, and J.C. went back to the chair and sat. That's not J.C. What have they done with him? 
Is he on drugs? Have they given him something to slow him down? Has he been tortured? Where's the JC we expected? Where are the ringing tones, the carefully chosen words, the gestures, all the things that he is? Where are they? What's going on? Ruth leaned toward her mother and whispered, Did you know about this? Marianne gave a slight shrug and a worried smile that indicated she couldn't explain either. If you had asked Ruth after this service, and thankfully no one did, what her father had said during his Christmas message, she wouldn't have been able to repeat a word. She couldn't see J.C. from where she was sitting. The pulpit and her father blocked him from view. I have to find out what's going on. Should I talk to this Reverend Edwards? No, I'll talk to Dad. He had to know what was going on. He had to be prepared. Jill whispered, Mommy, what happened to Daddy? Why isn't he preaching? Is something wrong? Shh, I'll tell you later, Ruth whispered back to Jill. In last time's reading, Ruth believed what she thought she saw, a guy who'd go golfing before he'd take care of ministerial duties. Now three months later, she's watching J.C. again. Something's happening, but what? Please join me next Tuesday for another visit to J.C.'s World. I'm Dave Stopfer.